for for Jack's talk. So talk about our flood resilience efforts and and why we were excited to fund the work that um, that Jack and this incredible team is working on. The slides aren't advancing. There we go. Okay. Can you all see that? Okay. So just a little bit of hydrologic background. So as most of you know, um, so on the left there, we're looking at um, recent changes. So documented existing changes in extreme participation, per, partic precipitation that have happened um, over the last basically 60 years. And you could see the Northeast is in the higher end uh, of these changes. And these changes are projected to increase uh, moving forward under, um, and this is the higher emission scenarios, but that's a little more likely um, uh, across the United States. So some work here in New York State um, is showing this changes. This is just simply showing what are the projected changes um, at the end of this century um, compared to that same period in the last century of what was then the 100 year recurrence interval flood. So that same size flood, how frequently is it happening um, later into this century? And across the state, um, we're seeing those uh, return periods shortened. So they're happening more frequently, um, becoming 30 to 60 year recurrence events across the state. So what does this mean for flooding in New York state? So we're seeing an increase in flooding in New York state for that. Uh, let me just keep it on time here. Um, for, for because of that increased precipitation, but because of other compounding factors, increasing impervious cover, building in high risk areas, aging and undersized um, infrastructure, loss of natural system function and sea level rise. And all of that is, is uh, resulting in increases in impacts to our um, natural and human systems in New York State. So one way we think about this, um, you know, thinking about vulnerability and resilience to the flooding in New York State, whoops, um, you can what? think about, okay, somebody needs to mute, I think. Um, think about uh, what is the exposure? So what are, is the exposure to that um, risk? What is the sensitivity of a system, social or um, physical? And then what are those potential impacts and how is the system, um, what is the capacity of that system to uh, um, recover from, adapt to um, those impacts? So using this framework, so we fund, as Brian said up front, we fund work uh, in, in research and outreach across the state in all of these areas. So for example, you know, there's work around, um, could, whoops, can be done around um, forecasting changes in flood frequency over on the exposure side. Sensitivity, we've done a lot of work looking at um, the capacity of culverts to handle storm events, um, you know, both creating management plans and, and doing modeling, and then understanding root causes of inequitable distribution of resources in the state. And then we've done a lot of work around down in the adaptive capacity. Um, again, these don't, these aren't all crisp boundaries, you know, there's some overlap here, but some work around in adaptive capacity around local adaptation, plans and designs, understanding flood governance, um, and uh, I would say this work uh, of John's group. Um, flood insurance uptake. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about a couple examples. I'm not 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 comprehensively, but give a couple examples of the work we do around adaptive capacity in New York State. So one uh, really long term and rich uh, effort we have is the climate adaptive design studios that we have done in the Hudson River. Um, and are now starting to do along the Lake Ontario shoreline. And this is with our climate team um, at the Hudson River Estuary Program led by Libby Zemitis and Josh Sarah in the Landscape Architecture Design, uh, Landscape Architecture uh, Department here at Cornell. And what they do is they work with communities to understand um, that exposure uh, side of flood resilience and then think about what can they do to either change their sensitivity 
or adapt to these conditions. Um, and what's incredible, I think, about it is that they're really trying, it's, it's quite a positive um, exercise. Mm -hmm. So they're really trying to uh, get communities to envision um, sort of a thriving future uh, looking community that's adaptive to um, climate um, using natural and equitable solutions. Another uh, work, a piece of work we do around um, adaptive capacity, um, sort of on the institutional side of adaptive capacity is funding, helping to fund um, a flood resilience network in the Hudson. And so they work with, um, convene a group of local governments um, to help support uh, their flood adaptation efforts, adaptation efforts, um, to facilitate building relationships across communities and to um, connect these institutions um, and promote funding uh, for, those, for those organizations. Mm -hmm. So jumping to Lake Ontario, another aspect of, of adap adaptive capacity that we fund is looking at and trying to understand um, flood governance. And so this is an example of um, an inventory that um, we've worked on, particularly Ray Wolf and Salker has done this work, um, looking at an inventory of the actors and initiatives in flood governance along the Lake Ontario shoreline and converting that into a social network. Um, uh, and then using this social network to do analysis to get at things like, what is the impact of policy on how um, communities interact um, to build adaptive capacity. So for example, here, this is looking at the network um, before and after Ready, the resilience, Lake Ontario Resilience and Economic Development Initiative. It's also, we're also using it to identify bridging organizations. So organizations that help um, connect communities um, towards uh, flood adaptation um, and pull them in through uh, funding projects, facilitating collaboration. So another piece of all this uh, flood adaptation, uh, adaptive capacity work is ensuring flood risk. So, you know, flood insurance, as I'm sure John will talk in more detail about, it's, it's an imperfect but central part of um, recovery from flood events in the U.S. Um, we'll talk more, but the National Flood Insurance Program is a program where um, the premiums are established by the federal government. Homeowners can purchase it for their their homes and their the contents of their home, um, but only if the community participates in the NFIP. And at least some studies, national studies, have shown only about 15, 50 percent um, penetration of flood in flood prone areas in the United States. So in this context, um, we have New York State um, has recently passed uh, the Climate Act, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Um, and it focuses on um, reducing greenhouse gases and setting fairly um, aggressive goals around that. But then it also set out, um, as many of you know, they've just passed the scoping plan and they have a whole section around adaptation and resilience. And one of the key pieces they have in this um, community and infrastructure resilience section um, on their strategy towards equitable adaptation and resilience practices and projects is to improve insurance coverage. So they're encouraging all levels of governments to implement strategies to increase take up rates of flood insurance and other coverage related to climate hazards. They also, they do caveat though that insurance, um, you know, the idea behind insurance is it can spread, spread risk. Um, but knowing that these strategies have to um, include consideration of renters and, and um, others who don't participate in NFIP, and then the effects of the flood insurance premiums on low-income households. So given all this, this, this is why we were excited about the work um, that this group is doing. Really, they're, um, you know, to promote um, uptake in flood insurance participation, you really have to understand the current state of, of flood insurance participation, trends, what are those drivers, and then inequities um, behind them. So uh, we're really grateful. We're glad that 
that you all are doing this work and I'm excited to hear more. Oh, I didn't put up my acknowledgements here, but thank you for the work of all these folks. All right, sharing the screen is one part, finding the, where the Zoom controls went when you shared it is another. But I think we're all set. Thank you, Kristen, so much uh, for that introduction. Um, thanks to the Water Resources Institute for their, your support through the whole length of this research so far um, and for giving us this chance to share our work with everybody. And lastly, thanks uh, thanks for everybody, everybody who's shown up. I see the names of a lot of people that we've worked with or learned from, and I, I we treat this we, we're getting ready to write a paper based on this work, and we see this as a really important part of peer review, um, getting uh, getting feedback from people who really are encountering these uh, these situations directly. Uh, so I look forward to our conversation. Um, so our, uh, I'll also introduce our team. So along with me will be Kate Foster, who will also be uh, taking part in the presentation, who has done a lot of the work uh, that, that uh, underlies what you'll be seeing. Um, also, David Kay and Shrona Allred are here with us, and, and our other colleague, Sharon Tennyson, I think will be joining a little bit later. Um, and so we have been working on various aspects of flood risk uh, perception, response, and management, as well as flood insurance access in New York for the past few years. And we're excited to share our, our first, one of our first uh, works through the statewide data. And... Sorry. Where's my mouse? All right. So uh, picking up where, where Kristen left, uh, uh, spoke to us before, she introduced the, the scoping plan from the New York State uh, Climate Action Council, noting a specific goal in increasing take-up rates of flood insurance and, uh, and with, with considerations for equity and affordability. And those are the uh, these are the uh, the issues that really motivate the work that we're uh, that we're doing. In particular, uh, right, trying to understand what are the very uh, what are the trends, what are the things that are that appear to be driving variations in flood insurance take up across the state. Um, and uh, so we're doing this uh, in the content in the context of the National Flood Insurance Program, which has three main parts. So flood insurance is is the centerpiece of it, um, but that's linked to floodplain regulations. And so for a community to be a participant in the National Flood Insurance Program, they have to have minimal regulations uh, for zoning and building uh, and some other management aspects of the floodplains. Another piece is that there are various federal programs of assistance for homeowners and for communities in, uh, in reducing exposure to flooding and increasing uh, preparedness uh, for floods. But we will be focusing on the insurance part, and Kate is going to start us on uh, on some of the details there. Yeah, thank you. So looking at the NFIP policies nationwide and in New York State, we see that in 2020, New York State broadly looks like the country as a whole and the policies that it has. The main difference that we see here is that New York State has more policies that cover structures that can have two to four families, which is depicted in the pink on these charts. And we can see that about two thirds of the policies, both nationwide and in New York State, cover single family household structures, as seen in the blue. For the purposes of our research, we focus on the single family policies. Overall, about a half of NFIP policies are in special flood hazard areas or areas estimated at 1% or greater chance of annual flood risk. Similarly, the single family residential policies follow the same pattern of being half of the policies in the SFHA and half of the policies outside of the SFHA. And of the single family policies, the national and New York state median coverage is, 250, is a $250,000 limit. And more than two thirds of New York state single family policies are at this coverage level. And then, mm -hmm. All right, and um, so, the, the, a very, very brief primer on the National Flood Insurance Program, which is a big and complicated thing that we could all speak of for many, many hours. Um, in the context of various changes happening within this program, 
Uh, we have been doing a project uh, with support from, w, uh, from WRI and also from the uh, National Institutes of Farm and Agriculture at the United States Department of Agriculture entitled Flood Risk in Context, Insurance and Risk Response in Flood-Affected Communities. And this, and this project revolves around three main questions, each of which brings uh, some different kinds of approaches. First of all, we'd like to under get a better understanding from people involved on how they understand, communicate, and act around flood insurance. And for that purpose, we're doing in-depth in -depth interviews with insurers, realtors, lenders, and people in local government. Um, second, we're interested in, specifically in the Hudson River Valley to understand how residents vary in understanding and obtaining flood insurance. And to that end, last fall, we implemented a survey uh, with, together with the Cornell uh, Center for Conservation Social Sciences of about 1,200 residents in Hudson River communities. And we've just gotten the data in and we're excited to learn more about, about those issues. Our third question looks across the whole state to ask how does flood insurance take up vary over time and space and what shapes this variation? That's what we'll be focusing on today with an analysis at the county level of national flood insurance policies data for all of the state. We also have some further more fine-grained analyses planned, but we haven't gotten through those yet. And our main outcome is, uh, is directly the, the piece that comes out of the Climate Action Council um, uh, uh, scoping plan, and that's take-up rates, which are the the households purchasing flood insurance as a proportion of total households in a county. And we're going to break that into two pieces. One piece is the special flood hazard area, which are these areas, as mentioned, that have a 1% or greater uh, chance of uh, estimated chance of flooding every year, where households with mortgages are required to have flood insurance. And we're breaking that apart from outside the SFHA, where flood insurance is optional. Right, so we'll be focusing on the key factors that may shape who gets flood insurance, like Jack was saying. And so whether an individual lives within or outside the SFHA or special flood hazard area may be a factor in flood insurance take up. This is because those who live within the SFHA have a mandatory purchase requirement with a federal backed mortgage, whereas those who live outside of the SFHA may voluntarily choose to have flood insurance. We expect different patterns and take up rates outside of the SFHA because there's more flexibility just in deciding whether to purchase flood insurance or not. And then another key factor may be, um, as with other hazards and preparedness measures, recent flood experience may be associated with flood insurance take up rates as households tend to increase protective measures, including flood insurance after experiencing damaging storms. Aggregate flood insurance take-up rates usually increase for one to five years after these major storms. All right. Another piece that we're interested in is uh, the flood insurance rate maps or firms that uh, that that basically are used to identify which properties are in or outside of the SFHA uh, and subject to that requirement. Um, and there, and if you live in Tompkins County, it's likely you've heard about these because our maps, which were made in the 1980s, long before a lot of big changes in development and also pre precipitation happened, um, are being updated uh, right now. And some preliminary new maps have been put out, and a lot of people who were not in the SFHA before will be in it. So one thing that new maps can do is just put you in the SFHA or sometimes take you out. Um, so, so, so place, counties that get new maps may be a place where we'll see changes in take up within the SFHA, but that effect might not be limited to the SFHA because studies also find sort of what, what they call an information effect, where the process of mapping things get a show up in the news, people start learning that other people have been mapped into the flood zone and are facing this requirement, and that conversation may stimulate ins insurance per uh, purchase both inside and outside of the special flood hazard area. Um, other, we're also looking at demographics. We're interested in equity, and so we uh, we look at race and ethnicity. Different uh, different studies have found different findings in different contexts. Uh, in some states and county, uh, in some states, uh, research has found that uh, communities with higher proportions of people of color have greater take up of flood insurance than others. Others have found no effect. Uh, we also look at median home value, which is a proxy for wealth. 
Uh, we would expect that in communities where average wealth is higher, more people would have greater ability to afford, afford flood insurance, and we might expect to see higher take up in those communities. Finally, we look at population density, which can reflect an urban rural gradient and might loosely correlate with local government capacity, although that varies across cities and across towns at any given population density. Um, finally, we also uh, look at a number of things specifically linked to sort of the mechanics of flood insurance policy. We look at, um, at, at cost of coverage. We expect that the more expensive flood insurance policies are, all, all other things considered, that, that uh, you'd have a decrease in take up, right? As things get more expensive, fewer people are willing to buy it if they have the choice. Second, um, because mortgages play a big, uh, a big part in the mandatory purchase requirement, we might expect that uh, in areas where a greater proportion of, prop of homes have mortgages, you would have more properties potentially subject to that requirement, and therefore you might have greater, uh, greater levels of uptake specifically within the special flood hazard area. Um, we also look at the number of policies at the start of a period, places that have all, where most of the SFHA already has policies, you might have, have less room for adding, or, uh, for adding more policies, or if they're low, less room for losing policies. So we wanna control for that. Similarly, we might expect that if you had a big increase in policies in a previous period, there might be a number of different ways that that could affect things. In particular, the, that, in particular, that people who have just picked up this new thing might not keep it for very long and after a few years decide that they don't need it. Um, these are some things that have, been, that have been found in other studies of flood insurance take up. So here we can, oh, <laughs> here we can sort of the change in single family policies, both within and outside the SFHA relative to 2009. Uh, New York State, which is in pink, the pink line, stands relative to the national trend, which is the gray line, and the other six states. Within the SFHA, we would expect that policies would increase. However, since 2009, there has been a broad decline nationally, as depicted by the gray line, and New York State's decline has been relatively small. Whereas outside of the SFHA, we see lots of different trajectories with the different states and national trends. And look specifically at New York State policies outside the SFHA had a sharp increase than decrease. This leads us to ask why there, why there is a decline in SFH policies if purchase is mandatory for SFHA mortgage holders, why the sharp rise and fall in non-SFHA policies, and specifically, how do patterns vary within New York State? Okay, and so to take a first look at that, we what we did was we we measured take up levels or the proportion again of household or sorry the um <clears throat> the, the the number of flood insurance policies within the SFHA as a as a proportion of the number of residential households within a given county uh, and we've got that information for all of New York State counties and then we and then we subtracted the level in 2009 from 2014 we did the same thing for the sub subsequent five years and we broke it into these two periods because of the different trends that you can see uh, in, either, uh, in either area, inside or outside the SFHA uh, in those two five-year periods. Um, and so uh, in 2009 to 2014, one key thing that happened in New York State was that there were some pretty big storms. We saw hurricanes Irene and Lee in 2011, and then hurricane uh, Superstorm Sandy in 2012. And so we might expect a correlation between the patterns of flood insurance and these storms, right? Based on what we said before, we'd expect that there is a bigger increase in areas where you'd have those storms. Within the special flood hazard area, that doesn't seem that 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 is not a very clear pattern, uh, if anything. Changes were pretty even across the state, with very few getting beyond 25% of 2009 levels. If we look uh, out, uh, if we look in the, su the the subsequent five years, we see across the state every county level unit except for Queens had a decrease in um, SFHA flood insurance policies, um, and some were very large, especially in in Erie County uh, where Buffalo is, uh, to which we will come back later. So now let's look outside the SFHA. So this is where people don't face that mandatory purchase requirement. And so we might expect bigger changes, right? Because people you know, are not being required by the government through their mortgage lenders 
to, to get flood insurance, but actually always have to make their own choice about whether, whether to get it or not. And we do see much more variation. We see in the western part of the state, uh, some counties that, uh, that had pretty, pretty big losses. And in the eastern part of the state, largely overlapping with areas affected by the big storms in 2011 and 2012, um, in very large increases, going up to over 100%. And there's also uh, there's there, there's also Niagara County, and I'd love to learn more about somebody from that region if we could uh, uh, could, could learn about how they had such a big increase as well. Um, in the subsequent period, though, con consistent with the, the the graph that we saw before, there are widespread decreases. Um, although again, there's a, there's an appreciable amount of variation there, and it's hard. It's Bit how we've made this map, it's not easy to see, but in particular, the uh, other than the Bronx, the boroughs of New York City, and as well as uh, uh, as well as Long Island, uh, saw very very small decreases compared with the rest of the state. If we recall from earlier, we noted new maps could directly map people into the SFHA, which would have an effect on overall um, insurance take up. We do see a bimodal distribution where much of the state is still using maps from the 1980s. This is depicted with the dark blue. However, looking at the green and yellow in the map, we see that half of the counties have had new flood maps within the last two decades, which might spur take up rates within these counties. Um, so Kristen kind of went over this a little bit, but flood insurance and flood prep, uh, preparedness plays a part in a long list of action for climate smart community certification. Uh, this certification may increase flood insurance take up. So we use a county-based level to count the highest level of climate smart communities present at county or sub-county levels. This is based on thinking that areas with more people and more climate-related risks would be most likely to adopt the climate smart community program, which might in turn increase the flood insurance take-up rates within these varying communities. All right, so now we are getting to our results from statistical regression analyses. The uh, the regressions that we're doing exclude New York City and Long Island, which differ in very, very, you know, very substantial ways with much of the rest of the state in terms of population density, uh, racial composition, governance, um, all sorts, all sorts of other things. I'm not saying that they're not important. It's just for the purposes of doing a statistical regression um, uh, that the, there were a lot of challenges statistically for comparing those counties to the to the rest of the counties in the state. Um, and I'd love to come back to that if anybody has interest. Um, so the first thing we did was to look at what are the factors that are significantly correlated uh, with changes in, in policies from 2009 to 2014 within the special flood hazard area. That is the area where the, um, uh, where, where the mandatory purchase uh, uh, requirement holds. And we see, first of all, as we expected for outside the SFHA, but not for within the SFHA, the cost of coverage how expensive policies are was negatively correlated with take up. So people who are subject to that requirement are nonetheless, or people who live in that area but are not subject to that requirement because maybe they've already paid off their mortgages, that could also be what's going on, um, are more likely, like, like in counties, like the number of policies is uh, had, had, was dropped where there was higher cost of coverage. Um, we also saw a significant effect of median home value but the opposite direction of what we expect, that places that actually were poorer tended to have greater um, or had uh, less expensive homes, which often correlates with uh, with, with uh, lower income, uh, had had uh, higher rates of, of take up. Um, and then finally, the proportion of owner occupied properties with mortgages has a positive effect. Um, and this may have to do with what I was mentioning before, that if you've paid off your mortgage, that requirement note does does not apply to you, and particularly we've talked with people in um, upstate and especially uh, up north uh, who have said that there are some areas of the state where a lot of people own their homes outright and are you know maybe less likely to purchase because that requirement doesn't doesn't apply. For the later period where we have a bigger decrease across the state, those decreases were largest again in places where uh, unit cost of coverage was highest but we saw no other significant effects in that regression analysis. Also, I, I should note that, um, that storm damage and firms show no, uh, new maps, sorry, have show no uh, significant effects here. 
And neither of our measures of, C of climate smart communities participation shows a significant effect, which was a surprise to us. So based on the literature, we expected a lot, to, a lot more to be going on outside SFHA. Um, however, contrary to other studies, we found that the unit cost of coverage had no effect on policy take up, out, take up rates outside of the SFHA. Um, whereas storm damage, so if there was a storm between 2008 and 2012, it had a positive effect on its take up rates. And new flood maps also had a positive significant effect on take up rates as well. And this was for 2009 and 2014. In 2014 and 2019, we see a very similar pattern where storm damage once again has a positive effect on take up rates and as well as flood maps. We do know that in both time periods, climate smart communities had no effect on take up rates outside the SFHA. All right, so we've seen the broad patterns measured at the county level. Um, and the analysis that we've done right, can account for variation across counties, you know, in terms of, you know, which counties had the biggest increases or the smallest increases in the earlier period, which ones had really big decreases or not so big decreases in take up in, in, in the later period. But that general pattern is harder for us to, uh, to, uh, to account for with this kind of variation oriented method. Uh, and so we want to come. We want to come back to some of the the accounts that we've heard in our interviews with uh, with stakeholders in some of these places. Um, one of those uh, one thing that has come up again and again is people's concerns about um, uh, about cost shaping how they think about flood insurance. As one homeowner in Troy told us, it's a percentage of your mortgage, so it's outrageous, especially considering when you find out what they pay for is your boiler and your hot water keg. The two of them together might add up to $5,000, but the, the deductible could be $5,000. Um, and another said, what would happen if my basement filled? Well, I'd probably have to replace maybe a panel and my furnace and my water heater. Well, if I have to pay eight or $9,000 a year or whatever it is for my flood insurance, first year is nine, second is 18, well, I could put that money in the bank. And if there's an emergency, and if I need 30 or 40 grand over four or five years, I've got it socked away instead of purchasing uh, flood insurance. Another concern that comes up a lot in our interviews and has also come up in, um, in other people's studies in the, in the New York and New Jersey area is uh, a lack of trust in FEMA and the process around flood insurance. That comes in various, uh, in various forms. One person said to us, flood insurance is riddled with, riddled with problems. Again, reading about people who have survived, Katrina, Sandy, Irene, the length of time it, uh, it, it gets processed and whether or not they actually get any financial support. My expectation is, another person says, I, I have flood insurance. I flood, my house is going, oh, they'll give me money. That's my expectation. But I'm not sure if that's realistic, you know, the way things are going. Um, another problem that individuals or some individuals express concern is they could be dropping insurance after paying off their mortgages. A homeowner said, we have lots of neighbors who no longer have a mortgage, so are not at liberty to buy homeowner's insurance, let alone flood insurance. So a lot of people don't have that cost, which is great for them, except for when something terrible happens. They put the rest of us at risk because if something were to happen as it did, it left the shell of a building for well over a year before somebody was willing to take the risk to renovate it. Another problem uh, that we have found in the interviews is that outreach efforts are difficult. And so, um, a government employee said, I went through repetitive lost properties and talked to people. I got some surprising answers. People who had it, had a flood event, and did not see the return on investment. They said, I paid more than I got out, so I'm just going to drop it. That's a problem. People flooded in, in last month due to Henry, Ida are asking, can I get flood insurance? And they had no awareness. A woman who had lived there for years, had gone to workshops that we provided, got freaked out when the flood actually happened. Similarly, it seems that insurance only becomes a public issue in the face of flooding. So when flooding actually hits, another government employee said, flood insurance is not an issue that's been brought to our attention. People haven't talked about it in a meeting. People call to make a complaint and that's how things get on our radar. We have highs and lows here, hill. People at top don't necessarily think they'll need it. I'm on the middle of a hill and my basement is soaking wet from Hurricane Ida. 
Yeah, so these, these last two shy, uh, slides uh, come from people who work in different communities. The first, a community where flooding is central to the local agenda, and even there, they're having difficulty reaching people. In a lot of other communities, it's not on the agenda until it happens, and that creates real challenges for being prepared for something that people understandably don't want to think a lot about. Yeah, perfect. And so what we have learned thus far as the recap is household flood insurance take up has risen and fallen across New York State. And the pattern is more pronounced for non SFHA properties. Within SFHA, higher cost of coverage correlates with declining take up. And outside of the SFHA, storm damage and new flood zone maps correlate with increasing take up rates. Demographics and climate smart indicators are not significant at the county level, and reasons for broad declines are hard to specify with these methods, but stakeholders' accounts suggest several different places to look. So this is our first round of analysis, and we want to note that, look, that I mean, any of you who are watching for this from across the state knows that there's a lot of variation within counties, and so we're only telling a really, you know, like the first the first part of the story. And there's a lot more to learn if we do a more fine grained analysis. So we're continuing our interviews with stakeholders. We're also preparing to do a finer grained analysis at the census tract level so that we can look at things from neighborhood to neighborhood. Related to that, we um, we have been funded for a, a related project to look specifically at equity and affordability as uh, the, a new pro program from FEMA called Risk Rating 2.0 changes the ways that they calculate uh, the prices of, um, of flood insurance policies. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, we have a survey uh, that we're getting ready to analyze of Hudson River Valley households uh, that we've uh, performed uh, in collaboration with the Cornell Center for Conservation and Social Sciences. So I'm sure I, I'm excited to hear your questions for us. We also thought we'd like to pose some questions to all of you uh, to see, you know, like based on what we've uh, what we've learned so far, there's really a whole lot that we would like to learn about what's actually underlying these patterns. And so we'd love to hear from you things like, in your experience, what facilitates and impedes people in obtaining flood insurance? Are there different goals and strategies appropriate for meeting the needs of people living inside and outside special flood hazard areas? And is increasing flood insurance take up always the most helpful goal? Um, a question that a uh, that a local stakeholder raised to us uh, that that uh, has really been uh, reshaping our thinking. All right. Well, thanks everybody for uh, for listening and sharing with us. Uh, I of course want to thank our funders at WRI and the USDA, um, as well as our uh, our formal collaborators, uh, including WRI the Hudson River Estuary Program, the New York Emergency Disaster Education Network, New York Sea Grant, and the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery. Um, and there are many others in the audience and beyond to whom we owe thanks. And we look forward to our conversation with you. All right, should I stop the share now? Yeah, that, that should be good, unless like people have specific questions and may ask you to show your slides again. But thanks for that uh, presentation, uh, Jack and Kristen. Um, if anybody has questions, we invite you to just unmute and ask your question. We want to keep this fairly informal and open, so just feel free to go ahead and ask. I see Brian has his hand raised. Hey there, guys. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you're, if there's some way that you're tracking, like, the, like private insurance offerings, and whether those are becoming more attractive uh, as as flood risk is becoming more a part of how sort of homes are advertised on platforms like Zillow and, and things like that. Yeah, and I just want to note, other members of our team, if you want to, if if you want to respond to questions, please, please, please join us. Um, uh, that is, yeah, uh, private insurance is on our radar. That's something that uh, has become available in the last decade um, after the NFIP 50 years ago was introduced because no private insurers wanted to touch flooding. Um, and so it's, it's present. And uh, after an initial increase, it's been really volatile in terms of the number of policies. Um, but there are a vanishingly small proportion of flood insurance policies in New York State so far. But we are keeping an eye out for that. 
Thank you. I will note that we uh, we uh, uh, that that our, our colleague Sharon Tennyson has been interviewing some some people in real estate firms, and uh, one told me that they thought it's still the risk is. Um, still, at least for their firm, beyond uh, beyond uh, like something that they don't think is going to be a growing part of their business. Hi, everybody. This this is Sharon. Jack, I'll oh, just Sharon, wait. Great. Um, so, in in speaking to uh, insurance companies uh, in the in the region, um, what they have what they have said is that you know the extent to which Private flood insurance is expanding is mainly in the commercial realm and in very um, high end houses. Um, but as Jack said, they did express some concern about the longevity or the sustainability of the private insurance market, uh, because from uh, their perspective, insurance companies are not maybe accurately perceiving the risk. They're viewing this as a great revenue source. Um, and they, uh, these folks, you know, these representatives who are just speaking with, with their own opinion, um, uh, raise the concern that, you know, that with the next big, big storm that comes, these private companies might just abandon the market. So they actually thought that it was important that we have a robust government flood insurance program to make sure that, you know, whatever's being offered is, is sustainable. You guys want um, to also, sorry, do you guys want to also mention the role that the, the cap on insure, the $250,000 uh, limit might play in what you just talked about? Sure. Uh, Sharon, should I take that or do you want to? Um, well, David, maybe you have some thoughts on that. I'm uh, well, I mean, you talked I mean, you meant you mentioned the high end market. Like I'm just saying that, you know, there's a limit on how much you can insure under the insure under the federal program. So if you have a very you know, if you want insurance and you have a valuable enough property, you might want to go into a private market to get that insurance. Yeah, I'll, I'll supplement on that, I think. So one thing to note, like most flood insurance claims, most uh, uh, are, are not for the full amount that a house is insured for, right? Most flood damage does not completely destroy houses. Um, and so on the one hand, some people argue that this $250,000 limit is reasonable insofar as most flood, a very large portion of flood insurance claim, you know, um, damage never gets to the point of totaling a house. Others would say you still want to have coverage in case the worst of the worst happens. Um, but the federal, but essentially that's something that's set by Congress and that that uh, changes haven't been made for a very long time. And it's really lagged behind housing costs, you know, housing costs now across the country. And so a lot of people are raising concerns about that cap. And as Sharon no noted, right, the, the that's that creates space for supplementary private insurance on the, on the high end. Now, uh, uh, in reading about the changes to the flood insurance, I saw numbers of like a, a cap on 18% for the increases that people would expect to see. I saw 26% this year and I'm losing sleep over what if it next year they increase it by 35%. That's, you know, Sorry for turning this into a bit of a town hall, but <laughs> how, why would you expect people to buy something that they don't see an immediate need for if every person they talk to who has it talks about how ruinously expensive it is? And I had renter's insurance and it was like $12 a month. That's that's precisely one of the questions that we yeah. that we are asking because the because yeah. your concerns are not isolated. Um, Thank you. I, I, I literally one, one forgot. Thing, yeah. Sorry. I, sorry. I literally forgot that I had renter's insurance for five years after I bought the house. That's how how accessible that was. I've never forgotten about the flood insurance. So do you I, I mean, do you find that you, you know, in in your neighborhood, a lot of people are raising these kinds of concerns? Uh, those that I've talked to who do rent, uh, it, it comes up in conversation. Granted, I, 
I am the idiot that bought a house that is literally adjacent to a creek. So but part of this is my own damn fault. But the rate of increase, or the rate that the insurance rates are increasing with no cap in sight is <laughs> my Cornell's not do not raising my salary at anything approaching that. That's my. Yeah, no, I, I I really appreciate you sharing that, and it actually I mean it raises a bigger concern because like the the official line that we hear on the one hand right is that there's this 18 percent annual increase cap I don't know about your situation but I know that 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 this is that this is not the only time I've heard that that it seems that that doesn't always apply if um, you want a data point I will bring you statements I I, I believe it I'm not expressing distrust no no I um, I, I, but, I, I but if you want data points to to, to wave in well, front of people's face let's I'll get your touch. data point Okay. Um, I, I think, it, but an, another thing to note, right, is that you hear the, 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 the official story that a very small proportion are seeing these increases, but for the people experiencing those increases, they're huge, right? And they don't feel isolated. And I think it's really important for us to address that. David. Yeah, I would just like to kind of draw out sort of the um, policy tensions that are inherent to this issue, which, uh, and I've also, led to some degree at the federal and other levels into what you might call incoherence in policy, uh, or at least back, some, back and forth in some of the policy in terms of uh, it starts to get implemented, then it doesn't. And this has to do with the idea of, of trying to, in fact, discourage people from, from uh, doing what Nick just described himself as having done from from buying uh, whether he did or not <laughs> exactly in this way, but having having from essentially living in high risk areas on the one hand, and then the other deep concern about uh, equity issues uh, and the impact on people when you when you're trying to use flood insurance, which costs something as a tool to do that discouragement you. You have, you know, pretty significant impacts on exactly what Nick said: someone's ability to live their life as they kind of plan well, and invested in. Uh, so, however, as a disincentive, the process is so opaque that I couldn't figure out what my flood insurance was until after I bought the house. I, I sat, I sat with the insurance. Said, okay, how much is flood? Well, we don't know. How do I? Well, we we won't know until after you. They buy the house and they do the assessment. So at that point, I uh, I have yeah, I can understand using it as a disincentive, but you the consequence needs to be visible. We have a question in the chat from uh, IT Blair that I'm just going to read out. Um, how much CS, how much is CSC scoring related to flood mitigation? Since Climate Smart Communities is a voluntary program where you pick and choose, are communities choosing points related to flood mitigation? Does it trickle down as a good proxy for private insurance uptake? Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that question. And I'm hesitant to answer it because I know that T who asked it is the expert here on CSC. So I'd love to hear your response, but I do agree, right? My, at least like my, my understanding is that, right? That the, the proportion of possible CSC points for flood mitigation is pretty small. There are so many different things that you can do. And what we should do as a next step is actually see if we can find which communities have points for flood mitigation as opposed to these other things. And I bet uh, other people who are in who are on the team or in the audience might be able to speak more to this question. And T, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. I wish I had the answer. This was a great presentation, Professor Zinda, and great work. Um, I love the idea of CSC. I just like the idea of voluntary participation and um, trying to apply it. Now I now work as a flood planner in Texas, and you know, can we kind of mimic what New York is doing? And then, is what New York is is CSC effective in terms of flood mitigation? I wish I had the answer. I, I do not. 
If anyone else in the audience does, let me know. But I may maybe some of us need to gather need to get together with WRI to figure that one out. I think I, oh, this is Kristen Hitchcock again. Just one quick addition to that. I, I think that's an excellent question, T. In it, I guess a great point, and I think Jack, you responded. I mean that I don't know the exact proportion, but you're right. It's a smallish proportion, but just so that people who are here in the audience, the other big proportion, there's a lot about greenhouse gas mitigation on a municipal level. So um, the, that's on the mitigation side. And then on the adaptation side is where most of these flood practices come into play. And it's not just about flooding. There is um, work in CSC around heat, um, around some around drought, um, but uh, quite a bit of it is either directly or indirectly related to flooding on that adaptation side of things. So vague. Sorry. There's some. Yeah, I would just um, uh, comment also from a uh, research, and I see there's another, uh, some other comments in the chat too, but, um, you know, I think there's a potential logic worth exploring, which is, which is uh, kind of amplifying what Jack did for both looking at the uh, participation in climate smart communities in general and the overall score is kind of a generic sense of attention to sort of climate related topics. And then also the very, you know, in this context, the very specific kinds of uh, flood related topics that are the most obviously connected to what we're looking at. Um, just because as Jack said, I mean, you know, there, uh, there's some reason to sort of ex expect that in addition to, in fact, some of the results suggest that in addition to sort of cost issues uh, and sort of the very practical, the, the degree of salience of an issue or the attention that's given to it can, uh, at the community level can, can influence people's behavior around these kinds of things too. question too if there's not if there's any in the chat yeah all right um I was, i'm just wondering because of, you know another thing that's a part of the flood insurance is that you have to be a participant right in the in the program which requires certain types of zoning and, and regulations do you guys have a sense of whether the requirements what types of regulations you know of, of those regulations have they changed a lot over that time is that something that you feel like is worth controlling for or thinking about I guess I'm thinking a little, sorry, Jack, I guess I'm thinking a little about how, you know, it feels like it might decide this also, this maybe vague idea around like uh, political identity and whether, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I'm just noticing like where some of the places in New York are, are decreasing their flood insurance and where some are not. Uh, and maybe I'm just making false correlations there, but just wondering if a, a general distrust of regulation is leading to, is, is kind of playing into this as well. Yeah, I think that's, an, that's a reasonable thing to ask and something that, uh, that has come up in some of our conversations where, yeah, where people, local officials, residents have different views. Uh, right, I, I mean, clearly a lot of people are raising questions about the efficacy of flood insurance and the NFIP in general. As far as what the federal regulations are, my understanding is that those have not changed much. And a lot of people, I mean, there have been nationwide uh, conversations as um, uh, as the federal government is considering, is, I mean, at least FEMA is, is opening some conversations up to see what might be a revised floodplain management requirements. Here in New York State, the state has some requirements that go beyond the federal ones, like two feet of freeboard, as opposed to like the one foot freeboard federal requirement. Um, I don't know the state regulations as, as well as I should. I don't like for in our conversations with floodplain managers, we've only heard about, you know, every once in a while communities that that temporarily drop out of the program because of a zoning issue where they permit a building in the floodway or something like that. Um, and so while people have concerns about it, it seems like it's not very widespread for places to actually get disqualified. Um, 
but you may more, know more about that on the ground than I do at this point. Thank you. I don't know if you want to talk about this, Jack, but it does seem like some of your work um, looking at flood risk and COVID-19 that you, you accounted for partisanship in some of that analysis that you did that, I don't know if, it, if it's relevant. Oh, uh, our, our comparison of flood risk and COVID risk? Yeah. Um... Let's see. Well, so yeah, oh, that that brings up an interesting point. So, so in a survey that we did of residents in Troy and Kingston in 2020, uh, we had been planning to do a survey on on how people deal with, uh, perceive, and respond to flood risk. Ended up uh, switching that to a parallel exploration of flood risk and COVID-19 risk. And to put the long story short, um, there were really uh, strong partisan divides on people's concerns and responses to COVID, but not around flooding, um, which is consistent with broader uh, uh, broader research findings that uh, a lot of people can think who might have polarized views about climate change don't necessarily associate the concrete experiences of local flooding with climate change and sort of and may be dealing with that more directly and not and at least in terms of thinking about the the direct issue and how to respond to it. Um, are not going to see the kinds of polarization that we see around other climate issues and saw and have seen around COVID. I want to note there was a question up here. Did we did we look in the uh, the uh, the community rating system, which is a centerpiece of most studies outside New York on the issue? And the reason that we did not is because very very few communities in New York State participate in the community rating system. It's uh, much more commonly uh, taken up in um, in states like Florida, where uh, a county can do it for the whole county, and because of the home rule uh, way that uh, governance around building code and other things in New York is set, uh, is set up, CRS generally has to be undertaken at a sub county community level, and a lot of communities don't have the resources and staff to do that effectively, or the number of policies to make it pay off well. Uh, at least that's my understanding of work done by Kristen and some other people in this room who might be able to speak to that more. But which, but that was the reason why we focused on C, uh, CSC and not CRS. Thanks. Yeah. We have a question here in the room as well. Hi, uh, everybody. I'm Zach Broder. I'm at Cornell. I'm a PhD student here. I had a question. Um, Kristen, in your presentation up front, you had mentioned sort of the community development and future. I just wanted to try to understand how how this national flood insurance program sort of interfaces with the commercial side of it of developing areas that are near waterways. It's sort of relevant here in Ithaca because they're trying to, you know, like uh, develop some of the waterways and things like that. That's a great question. Um, and I, I can't say that I'm expert on this, but uh, you know, as I think Jack set up a little bit for participation in the NFIP, there are certain um, things you have to do. One, the community has to be participating in in the NFIP, and to do that, they have to um, have uh, an approved um, map in place, um, and they need to uh, meet certain regulatory requirements. So they have to. You, uh, you may know this, so I may be preaching the choir here, but, you know, they have to have this, um, I always forget the name of it, but it has to have a local flood ordinance, basically, um, that lays out things around building in um, uh, flood hazard areas, SFHAs, different, different flood hazard areas. Um, somebody said, just one thing I'll just say, I think somebody said along the way here that um, it requires zoning. You don't have to have zoning to, to be a community participating in NFH, the NFIP, um, but you do, uh, so you have to, you have to, um, you have to have one of those flood ordinances in place and hypothetically um, uh, enforce it as well. So, um, you know, related to that, there is, it's not, this isn't exactly related, but there is the CRS that's um, 
yeah, somebody just mentioned in the chat. So the community rating system is a way to reduce, um, you know, flood premium costs by increasing um, flood prevention activities on a municipal level for those um, participating in the NFIP. And that includes things like um, discouraging uh, uh, um, development in um, flood zones um, in high hazard flood areas, protecting um, natural resources. So uh, uh, I guess that's oh flood damage prevention law. That's it. Somebody said that. Um, so anyway, so that's that's how they interface um, formally. Um, again, you know, informally, I think as David kind of alluded to, you know, having insurance reduces the risks that you're taking. You know, you're you're actually somewhat encouraging um, building. So by nature, building in a flood area. In a, in a high risk zone. So in some ways it actually is counter, the whole program is a little counter um, counter to planning and reducing risk, uh, reducing building it in high hazard areas. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. I see that Kelly has her hand raised. Oh, Kelly, Kelly, do you just wanna unmute? Hi, this is a, Kelly Higgins Roche. I actually work for New York State DEC in the floodplain management program. Um, and so I was really excited to hear about uh, this research. And, you know, I'm really interested in, in learning more about your findings moving forward. Um, I wanted to just to mention a couple things. So there's, we have 1,510 communities currently participating in the NFIP in New York State. Um, in New York State, while it is at the federal level, it is, is called a voluntary program. In New York State, environmental conservation law requires communities that have maps participate. So it's one of the reasons why most of our communities participate. I think we only have 10 mapped, eight to 10 mapped uh, communities that do not participate uh, statewide. And within those communities, federally backed flood insurance isn't available, as well as certain types of disaster assistance. So there's a lot of incentive to, to participate. Um, additionally, New York State uh, building codes have adopted many of the FEMA standards for construction in floodplains. So even those communities that aren't participating uh, would still need to comply with New York State building code. Um, it's still extremely challenging to, to implement this program locally. You know, there's a lot of nuance to it. There's a lot of requirements and it is not, as I'm sure you are aware from your conversations, always a positively received program. Um, that being said, you know, it, it, it exists because the risk in flood prone areas is so high that private insurers didn't want to touch it back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Um, and so I am interested to, to see kind of how that private insurance piece plays out moving forward. We've heard mixed results down in Puerto Rico, um, where I think it is a more prevalent form of insurance, where it was maybe not as successful as one would have hoped. Um, I also wanted to offer to I believe it was was Nick who who said that uh, his insurance went up by 26%. Um, if you are interested in sharing your information with me, I am happy to reach out to FEMA. They have a, a insurance liaison who can actually look into insurance policies and see if they are appropriately rated. Um, so you are welcome to, I'll put my email in, or actually I'm gonna put our division email into uh, the chat here and you're welcome to reach out to us directly and we can see if we can get information for you. Well, I'm already uh, scheduling a time to meet with uh, Jack next week to uh, show uh, the, ch the rate of change in my rates and he can add that to whatever study he wants. So I I'm more than willing to talk to people. All right. Well, I mean, we can actually have FEMA review your policy if you like. Um, that would be much appreciated. 
All right. Well, I will put my email in there and feel free to contact me. Yeah, that that hurt this year. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Kelly. And thank you for being the first to draw our attention to those points about uh, variation in mortgage penetration across the state. Yes. Yeah, something I've been trying to get more information on it myself. Just, just a crazy question. Uh, a, a few minutes ago, there was talk of the the dichotomy of making uh, insurance more uh, reasonable and accept, accessible, which acts at, to not be a break on development in risk prone areas. And then is there any thought to, okay, we have structures in these high risk areas. Do we encourage, do we as, uh, does FEMA want to encourage them to just go derelict? Or? There's, well, th this is, th that's, that's, that's the conversation right now. Um, okay. So, and there, right, and there are two pieces of that, right? One is just like, if flood insurance rate goes up, what happens to housing markets and do people end up abandoning properties? At or, the, right at, at the high end there. or can they right? if if i get right. if my flood insurance goes up to the point where i can't afford to live there who's going to buy the house that knowing that they can't afford to live there exactly so this is this is a fundamental challenge mm -hmm. that that suffuses all the academic and you know professional work that's happening around flood insurance right now a related okay. piece is is um is intentional efforts to uh, compensate people for, you know, people like people who live, who own the highest risk properties, where you have programs of buyouts, where people are offered market value or some related uh, rate, um, either individually or, uh, or across a community. There is a bunch of different programs in different parts of the country. Um, uh, and, and then uh, and then those places are removed from developable, developable land. And that creates a lot of complications because even if that, you know, helps right, solve the problem of not being able to get out of a property that you didn't know was at high risk when you, when you got it, um, or it wasn't at high risk and now some years later it is, you still got a situation where those properties are being removed from localities, tax rolls. And so there's a lot of really difficult issues around that. I bet David has more to say on this. And well, then also just, the cost of of dis, of removing the structure and demolishing and right. I mean, the you know there are instances where different levels of government have, because of the different incentives, have been working at cross purposes, uh, and you know uh, considerations, which goes back to an earlier question about you know why which is kind of a standard question in this area is why does local government, which in most places, not everywhere, but in theory has, certainly in New York, has the authority and practice to, to, zone, to use zoning to, you know, to make it difficult or impossible to develop in high risk areas. So why does that, uh, why has that not been implemented even, you know, I'm pretty old and my professor was studying this kind of issue before climate change was even being discussed uh, around these kinds of programs. So this is a very old set, set of tensions and, and questions about uh, sort of trade-off of livability and tax base and you know what the public sector's role is in trying to move people out of harm's way, what is the public perceives as harm's way, uh, and the individuals may or may not be making informed choices about where they wanna live. And then the second thing I just wanna bring up about what Jack was talking about in these programs is, and some other people like Kelly probably knows a lot more than I do about the program aspects of it, but you know, there's a difference between um, repeat, uh, you know, uh, Properties have been damaged repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly over time, and the attention that's given to those properties in these uh, buyout programs, or you know, there's I've been, been to several conferences under the label of managed retreat is one of the one of the labels that's given to these kinds of things. So there's a difference between that situation and you know less frequent, less. Uh, 
routinely damaged properties in these conversations. Um, and then the last thing I want to say, just as like a background to all of this, is the flood insurance programs as they exist now and the risk analyses are generally backward looking programs. In other words, they look at the history of flooding. Um, and there's a whole sort of new conversation that's really going now about what about projections in relation to things like sea level rise or the kind of stuff that Kristen uh, you know, kicked us off with about what's likely to happen in these places in the future because of increased uh, intense precipitation and other effects of climate change. On that point about managed relocation and retreat, I realize we're short on time. I just wanna note that there are other people at Cornell and other institutions that are doing more work directly related to that. And in the chat, I'll share the website of uh, Dr. Linda Shai, who has been making some really important contributions about the, the mechanics and the equity implications of some of these issues. We are almost at the end of our time. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, thanks, Jack and Kristen, for the really great talk. Thanks for engaging and asking all these amazing questions. Uh, the recordings will be available once we've finished all of the speaker uh, presentations. We're going to have our next one at the same time next Thursday. So we'll hopefully see some of you all uh, then. Thank you so much for joining. And I apologize for hijacking <laughs> this on, with my personal issues. <laughs> no, I'm that's sorry. Totally fine. Thank you all. Thank you.